May the Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to Jerusalem Presbyterian Church on this first Sunday in Lent. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Great Lord, as we begin our Lenten journey, as we begin the journey towards the cross, we ask that you give us strength for this time. We ask that you give us peace, but also that you give us compassionate hearts. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us begin the service by singing our opening hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Merciful God, in your gracious presence we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us, as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and have turned them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Do not fear, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. God is doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. By the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please pass peace in word or spirit to your neighbor. The first reading is from Genesis 3, verses 1 through 13. Now the serpent was more crafty than other, any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, 
your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree for, was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, made line cloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in my garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. Our second reading is the traditional reading for the first Sunday in Lent. This year it's from the Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter, verses 9 through 15. Listen for God's word. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts. And the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome to Lent. The first Sunday in Lent is marked in the lectionary by the story I just read. Different years include different accounts from the different Gospels, this, but there's always the same story. The story that occurs after the baptism of Jesus but before Jesus goes and calls the first disciples. In some Gospels, we have an account of the conversation between Satan and Jesus. Mark is just more into the straight facts without any of the details. This interlude is known as the temptation of Jesus. It has such an important place in the lectionary. It kicks off one of the essential seasons in the church year. And it, it does this because it reflects on the nature of Lent. Jesus is driven out in, in the wilderness for 40 days, just like the length of time that Lent is. And he's there to prepare himself for the road ahead, just as we prepare ourselves for the journey towards the cross. He couldn't call the first disciples. He couldn't get going preaching and teaching and healing until he had first gotten himself ready. So the obvious direction then when we look at this passage and its corresponding placement in Lent is to ask ourselves, what are we tempted by? Lent is this time of introspection. We're called to reflect upon our faith, upon our relationship to God, and we're called to remove any obstacles that we see between us and our relationship with God. So what are we tempted by? Traditionally, temptation has been pointed in the, in the direction of power or love. How does the old Perry Cuomo song go? You came, I was alone. I should have known you were temptation. You smiled, luring me on. My heart was gone, 
and you were temptation. Now, as an aside, I have to say this. This has nothing to do with the sermon, but boy, the 70s were weird, especially musically. How we had the height of disco and the ascent of heavy metal and druggy rock and how we had Soul Train and Southern rock like Credence and Leonard Skinner and Perry Como all in the same decade. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how, why, what. But, but that has nothing to do with the sermon. But Como's version of temptation does not need to be interpreted. Temptation is the allure of romance, of love, of lust. That's a pretty traditional view of temptation. And the other way that temptation is usually pointed is towards power or money, tempted by fame. That's the temptation that Satan offers Jesus. Uh, even though it's not in the Markin account, in the Lucan account, he talks about how he offers him the whole world if he would worship Satan. In our Bible study last week, we were in the middle of Genesis, actually at the beginning of Genesis, Genesis 3. And we had a good discussion of this other temptation in Scripture, the one Marilyn read, and Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden. What is the temptation here? We had a good discussion about what the meaning of good and evil is, that that's what he eats of, that's what she eats of is the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and we had a discussion about what does evil in this context mean? And what the story actually means is, is the serpent is offering the whole of knowledge to Eve and then through her to Adam. The knowledge of good and evil is the knowledge of everything. But here's the thing. We can look at temptation about love, or temptation with Jesus and Satan about power, or temptation with Adam and Eve about knowledge. But all of those seem to fall flat this year. This year doesn't feel normal in a lot of ways, and I, and I don't think we need to reflect on the temptation of love or power or knowledge this year. What are we tempted by in the time of COVID? What do we need to be on guard against? Well, let me describe it to you by telling you a story. Last weekend, I was chatting with my sister, and she mentioned that she had made meatloaf muffins for dinner. And I said, oh, yeah, I love that, that recipe. I love that dinner. And she reminded me that the recipe is really simple. It's literally four ingredients. And I normally do my grocery shopping on my day off on Mondays. And so last Monday... I picked up the ingredients and that evening made the meatloafs. This is different than my mother's great meatloaf recipe. This is a much simpler version. So you take a muffin pan and you spray it with Pam and then you take your four ingredients. So you have a pound of turkey, ground turkey, a tube of sausage, you can do medium or you can do hot depending on your taste, a can of chicken broth and a box of stovetop stuffing. You mix those four things together, you make them into balls, and you put them in the muffin pan. You bake at 350 for about 20 minutes or until the juices run clear when you poke them with a fork. The recipe made 12 small meatloafs. I had two for dinner on Monday. They were great. I didn't really want to freeze them right away. So I put them in the fridge. That was fine, because Tuesday night I had Bible study. It's, it's good on a night where you've got something in the evenings that you just want to throw something in to reheat it. Had meatloaf Tuesday night. Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. Thank you all who came out, and thank you to the helpers, to the barters, to, to Linda Ravello, to Laura Schultz, to Rebecca Schultz but I didn't get home from handing out ashes till about 6.45. So again, great. Reheat some meatloaf. Meatloaf on Wednesday. But there I am standing in my kitchen on Thursday evening, thinking, what am I gonna have for dinner? 
and inertia took hold. Meatloaf on Thursday. What's the great temptation during the time of COVID? It's apathy. Apathy. Surely we each have felt it over some of the past months. I, I, normally like don't, I normally don't like making statements like that. Surely everybody, blah, blah, blah. This is one of those things I feel pretty confident that surely we've all felt apathy sometime over the last year. And this week it seemed at least that it was pretty strong. Beginning Lent again. The cold and snow of February again. Meatloaf again. Staying inside again. Not going anywhere again. Nothing to look forward to again. I'm not sure how many people know this, but there's actually a third temptation story in Scripture. There's the temptation of Adam and Eve, which Marilyn read, and there's the temptation of Jesus, which I read. And there's the temptation of Job. What was Job tempted with? It wasn't power. It wasn't love. It wasn't money. He had lost everything. He had had everything taken from him. He was at the lowest point, And then his wife goes and kicks dirt on him. And she asks one of the harshest questions in all of Scripture. She says, why do you still persist in your integrity? Basically, you've lost everything else. Why are you still a good guy? Her solution? Curse God and die basically give up. Job's temptation is to give in, give in to the apathy. It's, it's not to turn his back on his faith, though it's sometimes interpreted that way, but it's just to give up. That's a temptation I think we all can understand during the time of COVID and deep winter. We must not give in, though, We must not become apathetic to everything going on around us. You see, apathy is the opposite of compassion. And we are to never lose our compassion. Compassion for others and compassion for ourselves. If the situation in Texas this past week shows us anything, it shows us the the danger of a government being apathetic towards its people. But it also shows us the support that people can offer each other when they have compassion for each other. This week I've heard stories upon stories from my friends that live down in Texas of of the good that other people have done for each other. People helping neighbors, people helping travelers, people helping strangers, people helping. As Mr. Rogers is known for saying, During times of disaster, look for the helpers. Being people of compassion. That's who we're called to be, not people of apathy. Overcoming apathy starts with one's own perspective. We can't change the pandemic or how long it will last. We can't change the cold and snow of winter or how long it will last, but we can change our perspective. My personal challenge I picked up even before this wild week is to be more positive. What does that mean? It means to intentionally think good thoughts of people. It means to be generous in attitude towards others. To be mindful in offering kindness. It's not a Lenten practice of giving something up, but of taking something on. Of each day thinking more kindly, more compassionately towards others. Will you join me in this? Each day, take a moment to to either reach out to someone in gratitude or to think 
good thoughts of someone, or when someone does something that you're like, oh, I'm about, you're just like, no, you, you dial it back and you say, I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be compassionate. Because those things are things we can control. We can control our own perspective. So I want to end this sermon by offering one of these moments of kindness and generosity and compassion. So there we were last Wednesday, on Ash Wednesday. We had offered ashes from noon till one and from five to six, and we'd had a really good turnout till about 5.30. At 5.30, when the sun was pretty much all the way down and it was dark and basically that shut off the whole thing. But the final car load we had was a family not affiliated with the church, or at least I didn't know them. We, we had quite a few people come through that were not affiliated with the church, which I think is a great thing, a great outreach. And this young mother pulled up in, in her big, in her big uh, black, you know, I don't know if it was a navigator or whatever it was, and she rolls down her window, and you hear just the volume coming from the back of the car, and there's a baby crying, and there are kids yelling, and, <clears throat> and she had four kids in the car with her, and we estimated that the oldest was, you know, like a fifth grader, fourth grader, and the youngest was a baby in the car seat behind her. And she said, thank you for doing this. I, I really want to teach my kids about Lent. And I said, that's great. And I ran around to the other side of the car, and I talked with the kids, and I offered a prayer for them, for their families, for their friends, and then I came back around and I, and I asked the mother and I had a prayer with her. And when I finished the prayer, I, I was like, what am I hearing? And the helper, the liturgist with me at that time was Rebecca Schultz. And she had approached the window behind the mother and was softly singing a lullaby to the baby. And the mother literally said, oh, I wish I could take you home with us. And, and Rebecca said, you know, I really love kids and I really love babies. I'm so glad our church did this ministry this week, but I'm also so glad we had that singular moment that Rebecca came up and started to sing to the child. That made a bigger difference in that mother's life than probably anything we taught him about Lent that day because we showed compassion and kindness and love and connection and generosity to them. So my act of generosity at the end of the sermon is lifting up Rebecca and thanking her for that. To God be the glory. Amen. A couple joys for today. First of all, we have received wonderful news that the Wentworth's daughter, Amy, I uh, had her latest scan and the cancer had not metastasized. So we give thanks to God for that. We are grateful. She still has a long road back, but uh, it was wonderful, life-changing news for that family. Uh, another thing to lift up, the Parsons birthday train rolls on with had, having it been Kelly's birthday this week. So a happy birthday to her. Uh, and this family who's had, I think, their whole birthdays are all in the month of February. So let's offer our prayers to God. Let us pray. Great Lord, we pray to you. We pray our joys. We pray our concerns. We pray our whole selves. We ask that you give us your strength and your compassion as we pray for Amy with her good news, and we pray for Kelly with her birthday, and we pray for all the joys in our lives. We also lift up those things that concern us. We lift up Marilyn's list. We lift up all who are battling cancer. We also pray for all who are affected by COVID, for all those who are sick, for all those who are on the front lines. We pray for those especially who are administering the vaccines, uh, but also for those who are taking care of those who are still sick. We pray this day for your church, for all the churches entering this season of Lent, that we may draw closer to you. 
we pray not just what I've spoken out loud and what others have sent us, but we pray the prayers that are deepest within our hearts. We pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, who taught disciples of all nations to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us conclude this service by singing our closing hymn. for you today so receive the benediction may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord's face shine upon you and give you peace and may god hold you in the palm of god's hands now and forever amen It's working? Is it working? I don't know. Is it working? Is it working? I don't know. Is it working? <laughs> so a couple prayer requests. Just down. That's not what it is. Okay.